it's great to have our band with us here in church this morning. It's really hard, actually. Uh, according to the rules, I'm not supposed to sing. I've been biting my tongue the whole time. Darren's probably been the same. It's just instinctive, isn't it? But I hope you've been able to sing and praise God. And it's so exciting to be taking steps back towards worshipping together in, in the same room. This is something which we're really, really pleased to be moving in that direction. And uh, it's great that some of you will be able to join us uh, next uh, Sunday morning for Easter Sunday. And this, of course, as Darren said, is Palm Sunday. It's a really significant uh, point in the year for Christians. It's the beginning of what we call Holy Week, the week leading up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And this point in the story of Jesus is actually a really significant turning point too. If we had the time, we could read this morning Mark chapters 1 through to 10. uh, And we'd see during that um, part of his story, those first two thirds or so of the account of Jesus' life, that Jesus almost always chooses to stay in the background. When he does incredible miracles and people want to shout from the rooftops about what he's done, he tells them to keep it quiet, to keep it under wraps. Jesus is constantly reminding people that the time hasn't come yet for things to go public in this kind of way. But at this point, in the, in the passage that Darren read to us, this is the moment when things kind of go into a new phase, when, when it goes into a new gear and things suddenly blow up publicly. And this isn't a mistake. Jesus plans this with every little detail dripping with significance. Every part of what happens in the scene that, that Darren read to us is there on purpose. And it's all there because Jesus wanted it to be there. He has chosen this moment to reveal himself And and he does that in a way here that tells us something shocking, something provocative, something amazing about who he is and what he's come to do. And so what I'd love for us to do this morning is just to walk back through this passage and and notice some of those details, some of the things here that are significant, some of the things uh, through which Jesus points to who he is and see what that says to us this morning. So some of those details. The first one I want us to pick out isn't actually written in, in, in the passage that we um, looked at this morning, uh, but it's the context which we're in. The first detail is the time. Uh, Jesus chose a specific time to come into Jerusalem like this, uh, to, to enter with this triumphal entry. He, he could have gone on any day of the year, I guess. But Jesus chooses a time of year that is really significant for Jewish people, a time called Passover. Passover was the point in the year when Jews remembered what God had done for them in the past, how he had set them free from slavery in Egypt, how through Moses, God rescued them. He liberated them. He broke their chains. And so every year from that point onwards, the people remembered what God had done. They remembered his rescue. And many actually at Jesus' time were, were not just looking back and remembering, they were, they were looking forward with longing, hoping that God would do the same kind of thing again that he would get rid of the tyrant of their age, Rome, and set them free, that he would break their chains. And Jesus chooses this moment to go public in this new way, to enter Jerusalem, because he wants to say something about what he has come to do, what God is doing through him. Through Jesus, God is liberating. Through Jesus, God is setting people free. Through Jesus, God is breaking their chains. That the timing is on purpose. So that's the first detail, timing. The second one is transport. Um, I, by the way, I should let you into this. I've, I've got six here, and I was hoping to get them all beginning with T. I give up after number two. Timing and transport, they begin with T. The rest of them, uh, I, just, I can't do that clever, clever preacher stuff. But anyway, timing, transport. Second one is transport. How did he get there? Jesus could have kind of got into Jerusalem in a, in a number of different ways. He, he could have walked like he often walked. I mean, he didn't have as many options as us, no bikes, no parachutes, no helicopters. But, but he, he chose to come on a donkey, And again, this detail is significant. Look at the passage with us from verse one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. It's like a spy movie or something, isn't it? 
A lot of people think that Jesus maybe kind of set things up, he organized things, he knew people in the area. There was a little kind of wink and a nudge and a code word, the Lord needs it, and and they let the the donkey go. Or it could have been, it's quite possible, that this is just a mark of Jesus' miraculous sovereign power. This is more like kind of Jedi mind tricks. You will give us the donkey, I will give you the donkey, and kind of off they go. But, But whichever way it is, whether it is a miracle or just some good planning, they come away with the donkey. Look at verse four. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? It's a, it's a natural question to ask, isn't it? They think someone's nicking their donkey. And so they ask, answer as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. So they get the donkey, they bring it to Jesus. But, but why a donkey? Why this form of transport? Well, actually, riding on a donkey is a really significant um, way of getting around. In, in Jewish history, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, there is all kinds of expectations about one who'll come riding on a donkey. Um, Mark is kind of understated, that's his, his style, but Matthew makes a direct link to the book of Zechariah and to chapter nine. I won't ask you to find it because it's kind of buried in the back of your um, Old Testament. It takes a while to, to thumb through. But Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine uh, says this, and this is quoted by Matthew's gospel. He says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus on purpose chooses this mode of transport to say something about who he is. He is God's king. He is God's expected king, the one who comes, not like your ordinary king, but humble, lowly, who comes righteous, who comes in victory. This is God's king. That's what Jesus wants to say here. And that is kind of underlined by another detail. Again, it's kind of subtle in the passage. And this is where I lost the T's thing. We've, we've had time, we've had transport. Now we have the route. Um, did you notice, sometimes the geography is interesting in these things. They, they come through two little villages, Bethphage and, and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. It means they're approaching the city from the east. Um, or I should do it this way, the east. Um, so you can see it in mirror image. Um, and you probably know that Jerusalem had a number of different gates. There were different ways to enter into the city. But, but Jesus chooses this particular approach, coming through these villages, onto the Mount of Olives, down through the Kidron Valley and up to where the temple is in the city. And it's no coincidence that other kings have done this in the past. Actually, this is the route that another son of David took. Actually, it's a route that another son of David took on donkey back. Uh, king Solomon, when he came to the throne, took almost an identical route into the city of Jerusalem. A pretender king was on the throne and Solomon comes to take his rightful throne on the back of a donkey down that same route. You can see what Jesus is saying as he layers up the meaning here in the way that he constructs this. It's almost like in the Old Testament you find prophets and they act things out with, with, with so much meaning, with so much detail to make a point. And that's what Jesus is doing here. So we've got the time, we've got the transport, we've got the route. We're going to rock it through the rest now. Um, the cloaks, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? Look at verse seven with me again, back in the passage. When they brought the colt to Jesus, sorry, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the roads, while others spread branches uh, that they had cut in the fields. And so as Jesus heads off on this journey, people are putting their cloaks on the ground. Now just think about what it would take for you to take your nice coat and to stick it on a dusty floor and to have a donkey tread all over it. Now you wouldn't do that for just anyone, would you? This is the kind of behavior that people reserve for very important people. And actually there's precedent again in the Old Testament of people doing this for kings of Israel. There's another king, maybe not so well known as Solomon, a guy called Jehu. Um, And when he is anointed king, people do exactly the same thing. You can look at, I think, 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, verse 13, and you'll see this. He's anointed king. And as he steps out to go and do what he's been called to do, they put their uh, their cloaks on the ground for him to walk over. Jesus, I think, is, is echoing this symbolism, reminding us again that he is God's king. And Jehu actually is, is sent to get rid of an unjust dynasty, the, the dynasty of Ahab and King, uh, Queen Jezebel. You might know their, um, their stories from the Old Testament. Jehu is sent to, to kind of cleanse the throne. And in a similar way, Jesus is doing this too. 
Again, the next detail is the branches. And there's more links to um, kings of Israel through the ages who were welcomed with people waving branches to um, celebrate their victories. The same thing is happening here with Jesus. The final detail, so we've got time, transport, root, cloaks, branches, is the song they're singing. And here we get to verse nine. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. We've sung those words this morning, haven't we? In a number of different forms. And it's no surprise actually that the people were singing that song as Jesus entered into the city. Um, If you follow the footnote in your Bible, if you've got one like me, um, I've I've got it here uh, on verse nine, linking to Psalm 118, verses 25 and 27. It's amazing what you can learn just by following the the links that your your Bible editors have put in there for you. It's really helpful. And it's no surprise they were singing this song because Psalm 118 is the end of a kind of sort of mixtape that they had in the Psalms to accompany the festivals where people would pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Um, Psalm 113 through to Psalm 118 were known as the Hallel. They were a group of praise psalms that people would sing as they were heading up and as they were welcoming people into the city for these great festivals every year. And as Jesus enters, they're singing kind of the final track on this, on this mixtape, Psalm 118. But the timing is impeccable, isn't it? They're singing that word Hosanna, which means God save us. It's a psalm that talks about God's rescue, God's deliverance. God who who saves his people and God who saves his people in unexpected ways, the one that no one expected to be of any use, God uses for his saving plan. And this pictures for us Jesus and and bring all these details and so many more that we just haven't got time to think about this morning together and a picture emerges. Jesus is saying about himself something shocking, something provocative, something incredible and something that gives hope that he is God's chosen king that he has come to reign, that he has come to set people free like a new exodus, that God has come to liberate and to break their chains through the person, Jesus, the Messiah. That's what he claims. Without saying a word, in this great demonstration, this great prophetic act, Jesus declares that he is God's king. Now I wonder what you make of that. My hunch is that maybe some of you react the way that I tend to react to these things. That's nice. I'm so familiar with these stories that they appear tame to me. Maybe you're the same. If you've had 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 Palm Sundays in your life, you've read this story so many times, you can't even remember. It sounds nice, doesn't it? Here's Jesus, everyone cheers, they wave their branches and that's it. But but, but try and put yourselves in the sandals of the people who were there in the first place. On the ground, what would it have felt like? I said that this was at Passover time. This was a point in the year when the city was swelled with with population. There was probably about 50,000 people living in Jerusalem most of the year. At Passover, some estimates say 150,000 people would be present, maybe even more. You just imagine if your street had three times the population it normally did. It, It wouldn't be COVID secure, would it? And, and this is what was happening here. It was also a time of intense kind of volatility. The Romans knew that the Jews were more likely to riot and to kind of um, rebel against them during Passover time than at any other point in the year. And here's Jesus with a worked up, frenzied crowd, three times the amount of people normally in the streets, packed into this already volatile city, announcing himself as the king. Now remember that Jerusalem was a city that already had at least two kind of kings. It had King Herod, who was known as the king of the Jews, and Pilate, the representative of the great Roman Empire that stood uh, behind him. And neither of these two kings had invited Jesus to come and to make this display on that day. This is a really kind of, this is a powder keg, this situation here. And as I was reading this through, and I I was trying to think about it in those terms, I couldn't help but compare this with some of the scenes that we've seen around the world over this last year. I mean, think back to the images of the storming of the Capitol building by Trump supporters in America. Think about the scenes, the shocking scenes of the military coup that's taken place in Myanmar. I mean, is what Jesus is doing here, is it, is it just an ancient version of those? a disgruntled minority who are kicking back against the establishment? 
Is that what we see here? Just another ruler grabbing for authority, establishing themselves as the um, successor, kicking out the, the current government. Well, I don't think that's what we've got here at all. I think there are a few reasons why what Jesus does is totally different. And the first one is that Jesus has come to bring about a different kind of kingdom, different to all the other kingdoms, to all the other establishments, to all the other administrations and governments that have existed through time. Jesus actually says as much when he's talking to Pontius Pilate later on in the accounts of the Easter story. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Another way of thinking about it is that Jesus has not come to seek public office. He's not looking to just get his bum on the throne of, of Herod's, um, in, in Herod's palace. Jesus has come to establish a very different kind of kingdom. It's political, hugely political in, 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 in certain ways. But this kingdom goes way deeper than any other. Jesus has come not just to kick out a tyrant like Herod or a tyrant like Caesar, Jesus has come to deal with the great tyrant that has caused all the problems that our world has ever faced. The the tyrant is sin. Sin is the word in the Bible for what stands beneath all of the brokenness, all of the mess, all of the pain, all of the injustice that exists in our world. Sin is the cause of individual problems, of corporate problems, of national problems, of systemic problems. Sin can show itself in omission. It can show itself in commission. It can show itself in in things that we're conscious of, things that we're unconscious of. Sin can show itself in the things that we just want to get rid of in our lives and the grubby little things that we want to cling on to. And Jesus has come to deal with sin in the big and in the small, in your life and in the world. Jesus' kingdom has come to rid us of that tyrant, to oust that tyrant, to run him out of town and to establish a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of peace, not just for his people, but for the whole world. That's what we read in Zechariah. That's what Jesus has come to bring, a different kind of kingdom. And not only is it a different kind of kingdom, but it's a different kind of king. Jesus is a different kind of king. I mean, as we look back over history, we see that kings and rulers typically come to power through brutality, through violence. Even today, where that might not be the case in every part of the world, often people establish their power through coercion or just through pandering and deception. But Jesus isn't like that. As we said, this is the beginning of Holy Week. And as we move through this week, as we head towards Good Friday, we see a king, a king who wears thorns for his crown, a king who is enthroned on a cross, a king who, instead of royal robes, wears nakedness and shame. When we come to gather again together on Good Friday, when we drink the cup and eat the bread, we remember Jesus who poured his life out for us. On the donkey here is a humble king, a king whose life is marked by love. Jesus comes to bring a different kingdom and he is a different kind of king. And so the simple question we land on this morning is, Will you follow this king? Will you choose to live for this king? Will you accept the reign of this king? And maybe that sounds like kind of weird, religious mumbo jumbo kind of language. Wouldn't be surprised if it does to you. What I'm saying is, will you turn from the things that you have lived for up to this point, the things that have kind of ruled over you to this point, the things that have driven you, the things that you've been driven by, Will you turn instead to Jesus? Will you let him be your king? Will you learn his way? Will you follow after him? Will you let obedience, allegiance to him be the thing that marks your life from this day forward? Because if you will, he promises that you will experience freedom, that you will experience liberation in a way that you have never encountered before. Maybe you've experienced in your life that you sort of jump from one thing to another, throwing kind of all your effort and all your energy behind this thing and then that thing, but you find that none of these things satisfy. 
that all of these things eventually in their own way enslave us. Jesus promises to run those tyrants out of your life if you make him king. He is the only king we can trust to give us freedom forever, to give us true liberation, to break those chains. So this morning, as we contemplate this king entering Jerusalem on a donkey, as we think of this king just a few days ahead who will be hanging from a cross, and as we celebrate next Sunday, the king who is risen from the dead, will you live for him? We're gonna respond in a song in just a moment, but before we do, I'm gonna pray for us and I'll ask the band to come and join me on the stage. Father, thank you so much for the scene that we've contemplated this morning of Jesus, the King. And Lord, we know that it is a bold claim. It is a radical claim to say that Jesus is not just the King of of people who uh, follow him, but he's the King of the whole world. It is a radical claim to say that Jesus is the only king who can give us true freedom. But Lord, we believe it. And Lord, help us to learn what it means to follow after him. Help us to learn what it means to be led by him and to find our lives um, freed, to find new liberation, to find chains broken in our lives as um, as we are led by King Jesus. Lord, we need your help to do this. It's all by your grace. But Father, thank you that you are able to defeat sin in our lives by your power. So Lord, we entrust ourselves to you and we pledge our allegiance to Jesus, our King. We pray all this in his name. Amen.